Okay, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I will present it for finishing this session, another extraordinary or rare items made for um, a mineral that is uh, mostly fluoride that we are presenting here. Uh, personal ornaments are made of a wide representation of raw materials, as we all know, uh, but usually it was uh, less characterized than we deserved. So uh, our main question was uh, to characterize the uh, translucent, transparent items, and personal uh, adornment items, for evaluating its distribution, its importance in that. And we have evaluated this situation for the first time in the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, we will start presenting uh, the, problematic, the, the problematic of this uh, Color, color value of translucent items. Mostly of them, as we will see, are green issues, are, are green uh, colors, sorry. But we have also uh, different patterns of color that are not usual in late prehistory ornamental items, as pink, uh, pale, uh, purple, etc. etc. Uh, ornaments, of course, are mm, very personal categories of transmitting identity in uh, late prehistory societies. And they represent a very special condition of rapport between the individuality and the group and transmit the, the social uh, roles and the social perception of the individual and the rapport with the, with the values and the properties of the individual in the society. Uh, color and brightness are being highlighted <laughs> not some last years, but some of them, that has been a secondary problematic of personal ornaments that have been a minoritarian question of research in, in traditionally in late prehistory. And we have started in the last decades uh, having more research in characterization of the raw materials, mostly in mineral ornaments. But also we have still the problematic and the theory, uh, the theory problems about considering uh, identity in these matters. Uh, I have chosen this picture for it's very representative and we have some beautiful <laughs> pictures and some very beautiful individuals with all the <laughs> bits and ornaments attached. It's just for reflecting that we usually uh, think about cold enclaves beads when we have these kind of pieces, but they are uh, more complex uses in that also attached to uh, textiles or to different complements to the clothes. In, arms and belts and etc. Uh, as we are sitting here in this work of Wright and Garrett, uh, the most complex also the structure of the communication uh, problem, the more complex also the, uh, the color combinations etc. That's also our, our point with these uh, translucent materials. I also referred here a uh, very classic word of Berlin and Kate, reporting a very known word, uh, work of Marshall Salins. Uh, evaluating also the complexity of societies, so the complexity of color transmission in different aspects of material life. As we can see here, white and black uh, terms or, or colors, uh, categories also, they discuss also linguistically the, the perception of that without, without entering this, <laughs> this part. As we can see, the people know the, the problematic uh, from Upper Paleolithic to the Early Neolithic, all the colors available on personal ornaments are black and white, mostly. And until the arrival of ambers and green beads and that in the early neolithization of the Mediterranean. We can see that uh, that tendency also, more, the more complex the communication skills, the more complex the social uh, code transmitted, the more complex and the more required codes are needed <coughs> for that, and colors are reflecting this uh, problematic. Uh, we have a problem with the uh, translucent, transparent items, mostly about the literature. It's usually the, the items on the last uh, old works and that were reporting now there were color beads, or, or necklace beads, and ornaments and that. Sometimes now concrete is in nothing about context, about raw materials, nothing. Uh, also, the raw materials were characterized mostly in the case of personal ornaments just by, by eye. So this is green bit, <laughs> this is black stone, <laughs> this is calcite, the most known ones. And uh, we have uh, detected 
translucent like beads are reported always as quartz. It was the only known mineral for the people that excavated that. Sometimes it's true, as we will see, there are, there are quartz beads too, but we don't have nothing more than trust in the, the world of these people until revisiting the materials. Uh, also, um, counting on the, this lag of characterization studies that I have talked before, we have that also some minerals and some uh, depends also of the components resemble the same. When we look at these examples, uh, for example, <laughs> we have white, uh, pink quartz, uh, pink halcy, pink mica, pink chloride. They are all translucent minerals, or can be translucent, can be white, pink, can be green, can be in so many issues, and only characterization and precise characterization can uh, solve this problem of identification. We can trust in their naked eye. Uh, we have some more examples apart of that of amber that is also very highly appreciated translucent uh, ornament, uh, raw material for ornamentation. And as we have, uh, I have said before, uh, the colors that we have also count here are colors that are not present in more raw materials or more uh, context. As pink, purple are not colors that you're showing in, in prehistory. Um, Science in the Neolithic, but we have some, some European examples also from Upper Paleolithic and Hong Kong. Uh, we have this uh, first approach for of fish uses of raw materials made in transverse and minerals and that. Uh, fluorite was the main uh, mineral that we have uh, documented here in the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, it's a mineral that is relatively frequent in, in the year, relatively. <laughs> Uh, and it's also very common, relatively, also in the western part of the European Peninsula. Practically stops in Germany, but it's also very frequent in France, in Belgium, in Italy, and also in the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, it's also a soft mineral, it's easy to work, and it's also easy to cleavage uh, due to its formation, its cubical formation usually, and also massive aggregations, etc. That it's also uh, easy as micas or other soft minerals that are are used for personal ornamentation. Uh, fluorites are common, as, uh, as I have said, in geological context, but not in archaeological context, or scarce evidences and scarce publications uh, concerning fluorites are mostly uh, regarding the western part of Europe, but particularly in Belgian works in France that has, has been documented some science upper paleolithic in Belgium, when we have documented also the there are works that have uh, documented also the fluoric production of ornaments in some caves with uh, circa 1400 granules or, or close to that uh, percentage in some upper Paleolithic context. And we have seen that in the Neolithic, the spread of the translucent beads made of fluoric goes over uh, France, uh, was the part of the uh, European continent and are present in so many funerary contexts also there. Uh, the only works that we had in the Iberian Peninsula, uh, as I have presented now, uh, are some sites in, in uh, old texts of literature that refers to fluorite. We have one work from 2002 uh, that performed some uh, PDX analysis in two bits for the same time that we have studied uh, after that. And one work in 2012 from João Luis Cardoso. Uh, regarding the Extremadura region of Portugal, evaluating the five sites he documented with fluorid ornaments. Uh, also, uh, fluorid ornaments were documented in Predilastic Egypt, just as a, as a remark. Uh, due to its easily working uh, properties and its translucent appearance, uh, and also its luminescent properties, that is, thermal uh, uh, luminescent, a part of fluorescent, that it, uh, we think that could be also a performative characteristic, characteristic um, of fluorite ornaments that are usually big uh, barrel beads that can afford uh, some light in caves or ritual processes uh, regarding the, the barrels. Our case study in the Iberian Peninsula, uh, we have one precedent, very early precedent, with uh, scientific characterization of fluorite ornaments from Casa da Moura in, uh, in Ovidos, in Portugal. 
uh, in just in the 19th century. It's very um, old case. Uh, the cases I have cited before, this is the only literature exists for the Iberian Peninsula, and the first regional approach, apart of sitting in Florida, sometimes wrongly, uh, was this work of Cardoso. We have identified 35 sites here in the Iberian Peninsula regarding Spain and Portugal uh, with this uh, set of materials, the translated transparent bits, and we have characterized 72 items. Uh, that we reported 72, 72 items. We have analyzed 46. As we have said, we have used it in different stages of our research projects uh, with uh, RAM spectroscopy, uh, spectroscopy, X ray diffraction, portable energy dispersive, X ray, etc. etc. cetera, et cetera. Uh, This is the, fortunately, also the uh, for it is a mineral that with uh, industrial interest. So <laughs> for our archaeologists, it's very hard to define geological uh, outcrops and define the, the provenance of these uh, geological source, sources. And we have this beautiful map <laughs> from the Geological European Institute where, with the main uh, uh, outcrops of the Iberian Peninsula in the western part of Europe with Florence. As we can see, uh, main of the, of the founts of uh, of fluorite ornaments, here are only reported fluorite ornaments, are very close to the geological outcrops. <coughs> Except, exception made for the Tagus uh, basin, as we will discuss in the last part, every, every region has more or less close access or regional access to circuits that provided these minerals. This is the inventory of the, of the items. It's a very scarce quantity, proportionally to other uh, minerals used in prehistoric ornamentation. And the total weight we have for fluorid ornaments at only uh, 264 uh, grains. That's very, um, a very uh, low representative quantity. There are some, some identifications also when we characterize the fluorids. We have to identificate uh, three components, of maybe rare uh, uh, bands for, for fluorids. And we are trying now to solve uh, the question of provenance. We are trying to identify this characteristic of fluorids, these three uh, fluid components uh, are representative of pro uh, probably provenance studies. More spectra, the, one of these groups is characterized for this band here, the spiking and 320 more or less, band in the Roman. Uh, these are the characteristic of the first group we have identified with this band. Also another group that is more uh, scarce in representation. And the last one is only uh, relative to the fluorid beds from darker colors or mostly purple. And maybe correspond to these rare elements that provided also a uh, color characteristic. Uh, we have the a uh, very special case in here in Anta Grande da Comenda de Igreja in, in Ebola region uh, that it's the megalith, uh, it's a very important orthostatic megalith from the last uh, 40 millennia in to the middle of the Calcolithic, to the middle of the millennia. Uh, this is the uh, representative boreal context that has provided more trans and minerals, three, four beads, one of them decorated as you can see here with uh, this reticulated uh, pattern and this bead is the second larger in the Iberian Peninsula also and this little one is greener than it resembles now and also Anta Grande da Comenda de Igreja provided other three translucent minerals two calcites no one calcite and two silicates also uh, not only Anta Grande da Comenda de Igreja but also Sao Paulo Dois that we have talked before about the fake embers uh, also has a very important decorated bead. It's also the first uh, in important, uh, the first important one in size and weight. And we have seen these uh, different patterns and also decorated beads are very rare in the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, this helps us to, uh, to avoid this uh, interpretation of just another green mineral to present this could be a special mineral, special consideration of this raw material in particular. Uh, we only have uh, the beads and made of fluid, but we also have two examples of archaeological use of mineral or fluid. But curiously, in a province of Sevilla, that not provided any uh, fluid bead. 
We have very large fragment of green fluorite, as you can see here below, with 90 grams practically. Thank you. <laughs> and another fragment, uh, maybe a, a prism of fluorite, green fluorite too, in Valencia de la Concepción, very well known thermidine site, with only one gram. It's not interesting, but they are the only examples used in archaeological context, both of the third millennia. Cuadro de is a Tholos, that is very well defined chronologically, also has the Bakers and that. <coughs> and they are the only two examples that we have recorded till now in the Iberian Peninsula of fluoride mm, minerals used in, in archaeological context of the late period. Other raw materials that we have identified in this, uh, this pursuit of transurtain minerals are calcites that are also used in, in the late prehistory uh, burials in the form mostly of betilic items, special uh, items, mostly in Portugal, that we have some translucent uh, idols also, etc. Silicates that are also frequent in prehistoric ornamentation in the form of micas, etc. But are more scarce in translucent forms. And also quartz is the most common mineral in the, in the earth, but <laughs> we don't have uh, practically any bead made of quartz, but we have a very large set of assemblages in rock crystal and quartz in every context in the Iberian Peninsula also, but uh, using quartz as a very common uh, lithic provider, not uh, as uh, ornament. There are the, the spectra of calcite that we have identified in some cases, just for exemplified. Uh, example of silicates and quartz beads that we have characterized both in Portugal. <coughs> the spectra of the quartz beads of Sao Paulo that we have also received. And uh, according to the, to the performance analysis, we have recorded 33 fluoride beads, 10 calcite beads, 7 quartz beads, 5 silicates, and 17 undefined transfer beads that weren't preserved till, till now or are in lost collections, are, are in <laughs> very uh, uh, restrictive museums, uh, etc. Or also, this, uh, where are, we, we can find this uh, set of materials. We also have a very, pro uh, very important problem with the chronological uh, approach to these materials, because usually don't have precise chronological uh, association with materials or precise, <laughs> precise chronological uh, association with context or whatever, but we can assemblage uh, these materials with the transition of the fourth third millennia mostly, and also to the middle part of the third millennia, due to its nature. Most of the contexts were uh, megalithic monuments, or tortatic megalithic monuments, that are uh, 40 examples of 40 sites of megalithic uh, monuments, eight natural keeps with long occupations, funerary occupations, from the late Neolithic to the uh, uh, late Calcolithic, and also, we have uh, two contexts that are not funerary, that are Villanova de Sao Pedro and Lesella, but both are Calcolithic fortified sites, very well known in the Tagus Basin, that also provided uh, one uh, floor beat each, uh, each one. As uh, last conclusions, as the first approach to this uh, problematic in the Iberian Peninsula, we can affirm that. Uh, Probably, probably Florida had a special consideration in the circulation of raw materials for making ornaments due to its nature, uh, to the translucent and visual appearance, and also the, these strange colors, pink and purple, that can be, can be seen. And, but also for these four scents and thermal scent properties that are exclu exclusive from Florida. Other minerals have also been identified. It's a very uh, limited range anyway, anyway. other quartz, calcium, muscovites, etc., silicates, but with, with a very scarce representation on the, on the archaeological record. Uh, the inventory that I have talked before, uh, from the only eight sites known to now in the Iberian Peninsula with fluorite ornaments, we have provided 33, so this, it was necessary to, first, to make these approaches to raw materials in uh, all contexts revisited. The consumption of fluoride, as if you remember the map, uh, is mostly Atlantical in the northern part of Tagus uh, River, that in, in, in the southern part of the Tagus, in the Setual Peninsula, seems that uh, the circulation of fluoride could be uh, could be coming from the northern part of Sierra Morena to, to the western part, sorry, of Sierra Morena complex, and we are 
trying to evaluate now this um, issue of provenance. But seems that it's another circulation. The same case is in the in the Guadalquivir uh, basin. These cases I have presented with minerals and are close also to geological uh, outcrops of fluorite. So we can discard this local use also. And Tagus is also exempt for this uh, proximity to uh, geological sources of fluorite that we think that also Tagus basin present an extraordinary amount of <coughs> exotica and ivory, embers, etc. that can be uh, uh, also help us to to affirm the, the extraordinary presence of these materials supports the special uh, consideration of fluid. Um, as I have said, most also of the context studied here are important <coughs> monuments, important funerary context with very large uh, amounts of exotica or very pres considered prestige innovations or prestige uh, burials or prestige items, etc. Between them, we have found these uh, translucent beads. And as I have said, the chronological uh, uh, mark of this uh, translucent beads regards the last part of the fourth millennia and in the middle of the third one. Uh, the only evidence we have recorded here in the, in the Iberian Peninsula concerning, uh, concerning the Bronze Age is in the Argaric area and are two fluorite beads that are in uh, the town uh, 111 in Fonte Alamo. It's a very important site also of agaric culture. Um, this is the only example we have till now of, of fluorid consumption here. I, I, if I don't mind, there's also a fluorid bead in, in Belgium also for the second millennia. So we can also establish this continuity or symbolic continuity in the early Bronze Age from transit minerals. So thank you very much for your attention. And I'm for the questions.